put off by how long this video is, don't worry. I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast. So while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. If the video is simply too long for you, I did record a shorter version and the link is in the description box. 300 movie view. The year is 480 BC. The Persian Empire is threatening Greece with invasion and enslavement. King Leonidas of Sparta is rather undiplomatic in his greeting of a Pers Persian messenger and he realizes that something must be done in order to to protect Greece and when the ephors and their oracle is basically like priests refuse for him to take the army into battle he, he wouldn't be able to it, it would be illegal for him to bring the army so he brings what he can the 300 men in his personal guard to thermo the, the hot gates is what they call it and there they will make one last stand against the Persian Empire and prove to the so-called God King Xerxes that not everyone will kneel before him. This... Perhaps I should discuss this as an adaptation first. Now, courtesy of the library, I managed to read the entire original and Frank Miller's work in the comic is quite... It's, it's translated quite well. There, there are, of course, some things that are a little more troublesome. The, his, his use of silhouette of, of these stark contrasts is difficult to translate into film, into moving pictures. It's very much... There's a lot of blank space in, the, in, in his art and basically, you know, you use your imagination to fill that in. That's not gonna work in a live-action film, so... Uh, yes, live action, heavily CGI. Anyway, it's not 2D animation, is what I'm saying. And this is uh, that's an area where the you know Sin City, the movie, did better because it's just it's, part of it is that it's in black and white. It allows it to obscure more detail. Where here that, yeah, doesn't work out quite as well. Now, it is a highly faithful adaptation. Some, some have said that it's excessively, you know, the, the slavish devotion to bring the panels to the screen kind of hamper the, the battle scenes and the like. I suppose there is truth to that. I would personally say it's still a ton of fun, and it feels, you know, the, the battles still feel big, but... And, and certainly it's nowhere near as... I mean, the action here, I would say, is much better than in Watchmen. Which is definitely a film that's hampered by the, the slavish devotion. 
Now, some changes are made, this fleshes out some things that are really only hinted at in the comic. The, the comic, the, the format of the comic is also just, you, you don't have to show as much and spell as much out, at least as, as is expected from an American film. And in, in addition, this very much straightens out the chronology where in the, in the comic you have these various flashbacks to explain things where here it's more that things, things are told fairly chronologically in order just one or two jumps and flashbacks and the like and we also there are a number of scenes that aren't in the comic that break up the we, we spend a lot of time at the hot dates with just you know in between battles and during battles and having Basically just one setting is okay for a comic book, but it, it, a film, you, you ex again, you expect more from an American film at least. And so here we have cutbacks to Sparta itself where King Leonidas' wife, the Queen Gorgo, is trying to, to, to gather some reinforcements. Ba basically, she goes, she, she tries to get an audience with the council where she, you know, might be able to persuade them to send more troops to help him. And there, there are also a couple of cuts to Persian I, I don't know exactly where it's the, that's taking place, but, you know, areas dominated by Persians. And I suppose that more or less covers, his, covers it as an adaptation. Also, the, the film adds far more fantastical elements with creatures and just, yeah, it, it makes it more outlandish, where the, the novel is much more, yeah, it, it doesn't have those, quite as many of those elements. And I would say that it's really, director Zack Snyder, you know, putting his imagination into the project. It feels like it belongs. I, I watched the film long before I read the comic. I only very recently read the, the graphic novel and it didn't, I couldn't really tell what, you know, what was in, the, what, yeah, what was in the comic and what was made up for the film. You know, have, having read a good deal of Frank Miller long before watching the movie the first time when it came out, and yeah, it just it felt like it it fit right in there. It basically, you know, Zack Snyder took the comic and boosted it further and just went with it. Now, the and and of course the 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 more fantastical elements are because the whole thing is a story being retold. The, we're introduced to the character of Delios, who is, you know, he's, he's Spartan, he's a great warrior, but he's also a great storyteller. And, you know, every, everything is narrated in his voice. And we find that out you know, very early on. I mean, the, we get like a 10-15 minute opening and then it cuts to Delios having finished one story and we get a face to match the voice and, you know, it's, it's clear 
this is the guy who's who's telling us the whole thing. He's a Spartan, and he's specifically telling the story to get the blood boiling, you know, persuade the listener that the Persians are awful, that the Spartans are amazing and pretty much flawless, and this whole thing. So, the, the film, as a result, is larger than life, and, you know, it, it is very much an idealized vision of the, the, the whole event. It's very much this macho male power fantasy kind of thing, and it's, yeah, it, it really plays into all of that with, you know, you've got the, the strong, virile, you know, practically naked men on the one side, and you've got, you know, the, yeah, the bad guys on the other, the, it's, it's very black and white in that way, and I, I realized that this offended Iranians, which, you know, the, the, what was Persia then is Iran now, as, as far as I understand, and it's, I, I'd say most of it is just that it's being told from an, from a self-admitted biased source, this one Spartan who really wants us to hate Persia and to love Sparta. Now, the, to, to get more into it, the, actually that's one more area where this is, is like different from the comic. This adds a scene or two that show the, the the evil deeds of the Persians, where in the graphic novel it is just very much, you know, this is Sparta, yes, the, this is Sparta, you don't belong here, and we're not going to submit to your lord, where here we have a more substantial indication of what actually you know, what, what they're trying to avoid. They, they come across this town or village which has been destroyed, and it's, it's immediately clear that the Persians have to be stopped. Now, yes, the, the Persians are made out to be these... Excuse me, these very perverted and arrogant, you know, they, 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 there's this running theme of the Persians either demanding submission or bribing people. That's so very much, you know, you have this this dichotomy of the Spartans who fight and who stand their ground, and the Persians who don't really... The, the, it's, there's, there's a repeated line of the only thing that Xerxes asks is that you kneel before him. As long as you submit to him, he will give you anything you want. And... Yeah, it's, it's very, it's, it's an effective way to really get us, get us riled up. And it is, it is of course not, it is not historical. I, I always say that you should never go to the theater for, you know, if it's not a documentary, if it's fiction, then, you know, don't expect it to be, you know, accurate. Go, go research it afterwards for yourself. Now, the... It's, and it's been pointed out that among the... There's actually like a historical reason that maybe the Spartans felt that they had to go protect the hot gates because there was something that they hadn't participated in, I don't remember the exact details, and 
and I, I could imagine, and again, the, this whole film is being told from the perspective of a proud Spartan. It's, it's very nationalist, kind of... The, there are those that call it propaganda, and I, I don't really disagree. I just, just... Just let us keep in mind that it is not really... It's not saying specifically that this, you know, this country or that country are evil or that country and this country are good. It's just very much you have democracy versus this kind of, you know, tyrannical regime. There is, there is a continued, again, dichotomy of the the, the warriors of Sparta versus the slaves of the Persian Empire. The, you have these proud men who have trained all their lives to be warriors, and then with, with Persia, they're, they're all just, yeah, slaves. They're, they're there to be used by others. It's, I mean, there, there, are, there are several very strong values in this of, <clears throat> excuse me, glory, responsibility, honor, it's, you know, sacrifice, loss, it's, yeah, it's, it's very much something that, you know, yeah, gets, gets you, if, if this was made back when, you know, Greece and Persia, then, then this would work as a kind of, you know, yeah, as a propaganda piece that riled people up and got them to sign up for, you know, for, for a tour of duty. Now, it's, it's also worth noting Frank Miller wrote the graphic novel in 98 based on excuse me, having wanted to do it for a while. When he was a kid he watched the 1962 movie The 300 Spartans and it further altered his concept of the hero with, with the notions of the, that the hero doesn't always win and that sometimes the hero has to sacrifice himself in order to be a hero. And this is also very clearly shown here in, in this that there is a, you know, the, the idea of, of dying on the battlefield is you know, they, they realize that that might happen, but they also, they, they won't back down. Now, the, the film is heavily stylized with, it's, it's been noted that the, there's never any blood on the ground. It, you might see it flying through the air, but it never really touches the ground, and we have some, you know, there, there are various aspects, and again, this is done as, in, entirely intentionally, it is supposed to be a arousing tale, it is, it's not supposed to seem realistic, and the, you know, the Spartans are nearly naked, and this follows the Roman art concept of heroic nudity, of showing the beauty of the human body, where in reality the Spartans did wear armor. Now, the, the, the use of color is quite nice. The, the things tend to be rendered in either this very golden sunlight or this blue 
hue of moonlight and ev everything really looks at, at the same time kind of you know real period piece kind of thing and at the same time kind of grand and you know without giving too much away you see in in some of the trailers the there's this giant that they they use to to fight and Xerxes himself is like you know huge tall guy so it's yeah, and, and it, it mixes the two rather well. There's also a, an extreme amount of violence, or extreme... It, there's... The violence is gratuitous, is perhaps the, the better way to express it. And... The, the, the use of green screen pretty much you know, pretty much everything being green screened makes it feel more painted than real. It, not, not so much filmed as painted carefully. And the... And, and I think this is the first film where Snyder shows... Uh, utilizes the slow motion, fast motion kind of you know, his, his trademark of that. I, I'm pretty sure there wasn't any in his Dawn of Dead reboot, remake. But it has been a while. So, it's, it again, it, it it's very useful in making it feel like a comic book. It's, it has this feel of sort of the, the unreal the and it's and and it's also you know it's it's been noted that there's a lot of slow motion in the film and there is but it's rather well used i don't think there was really anything where it felt like something shouldn't have been in slow motion or a a slow motion scene went for too long or the like which is very much, you know, that, that's when it's really bad, I, I would say. And that happens in, you know, certainly Sucker Punch. Yeah. So, the, the cinematography is gorgeous. The, a lot of the fights you'll have at least one shot where the camera kind of stays for a while on just one or maybe a couple of the Spartans fighting and it will just follow them as they you know run and attack one by one it might spin slowly around them to you know and just one Persian after another rushes in and is killed and it, it's it's very much these, these these typical Hollywood action hero moments where the the hero is invulnerable and with ease takes out numerous of you know very powerful enemies and it does what only the best of these Hollywood action films do, it makes it exciting. It makes it not only fun to watch, but it's still really tense. The, the, the battle involving the giant, for example, and just various of them, there is a clear, like, as the movie progresses, more difficult, you know, tougher opponents for, you know, emerge from the Persian forces, and we do see that, you know, not everyone is taken out with ease. Now, the... It's very much a fun ride, and that, that sounds like the kind of thing that, you know, it's, oh, it's a roller coaster ride that can be said about any movie, but it really is 
is the kind of thing where you just sit down for you know the hour and forty five minutes it, it lasts and you just have fun. It's yeah, it's it's enjoyable from start to finish. There's no point where you really want it to end or yeah, any anything like that. There's a nice sort of Shakespearean backstory to some of it. We have this it's, it's it's said very early on in the film that basically the the Spartan society used eugenics and I, as far as I understand they did so in, in real life as well and basically there's this one guy who shows up and and tries he, he wants to help named named if if I was these and he is deformed and he the only way he survived was by his parents taking him out of Sparta when he was born because they could tell that otherwise he would simply be discarded and yeah I'm, I'm not going to give away exactly where these things go but it's you know there there is something to it it is it is an interesting exploration and I've seen that apparently some people felt that this was like anti-disabled I don't really see it if I can't really discuss it in detail in this video because of spoilers but I personally read it the exact other way around now the yes yeah, so so among the complaints this has received are that the characters are bland and there's really not much plot and that's very much true there's basically everything revolves around this one battle and the Spartans being you know born and bred badasses of just their, their warriors through and through no one else is as good as them even their fellow Greeks aren't as good as them the, the Athenians are dismissed with one line early on and they, they do f the Spartans fight with other Greeks and they're described they're they're very arrogantly described as ah oh, they're they're brawlers they're not warriors and yeah, they they do their part whatever let's turn our eyes back to the Spartans come on now and it's it's again this I if it wasn't so blatant and so. It, it, yeah, I, I don't know how... Some people seem to think that this doesn't realize how, how arrogant and how obnoxious it's being in its macho, just completely, you know, it goes all out with that. I'd say it's, it most definitely knows. It just revels in it. It, it wants to be that obnoxious. And that's, I'd say that's what makes it enjoyable. I've seen tons of movies that are overly macho and where it doesn't work and this just isn't one of them. Not to me. Now, the, the battle choreography is excellent. The, the, the fights are never boring. And again, I, a lot of it is shown in these, you know, the, the camera focusing on one or a couple of Spartans fighting and without the camera really cutting. The, the shots linger as more, you know, more Persians are disposed of by the Spartans. And you would think that this would end up being, excuse me, you know, just 
it would get tiring, but it doesn't. And this is, you know, this is in part due to the choreography, in part due to the cinematography. Zack Snyder is excellent with a camera. Now, and the, the creature design and the effects are also very nicely done. You, you really remember the, the beasts you see in this movie. Now, the, and this, this is also one of the sort of, sort of the comic book film. It is, of, of all the films adapted from comic books, this is one of the ones that Motorcycle most feel like a comic book up on the screen. And this is, again, this is in part of the, you know, in part these long shots where it doesn't really cut, evoking the, the panels of the, of, of the comic book, which is actually a little interesting because the reason this is so wide is actually that it's, it's all two-page spreads. I imagine the car's head exploded when you read it. Now, the, let's see, we, the, the film has a well-deserved R rating and apparently the studio initially wanted Snyder to do it as a PG-13, but he insisted and finally got his way. And that is exactly as it should be, telling a Frank Miller story without an R rating. Well, to be fair, that wasn't the only thing that sank the spirit, but still, yeah. And, and telling this story without an R rating would, would be ridiculous. This is Michael Fassbender's debut, and he does pretty decently, I mean, like I said before, there's not a ton of character, but, you know, it's not the most... It's, his, his part is slightly... It's the kind of thing that would be easy to really mess up. He's kind of the... This really hyper kind of, he really wants to impress Leonidas kind of thing, and he's constantly like yelling and laughing and all this stuff. You know, not, not like out of order kind of thing, but just whenever there is something, you know, he, I mean, there's one of the first scenes that, of, of this is where he assembles these, he, he has these 300 troops in front of him, he's talking with his captain about them, and literally, like Fassbender, basically, you know, breaks rank and just yells at Leonidas, we will fight for you to the death, my lord, you know, just this, and it's a really hammy part, really, and Fassbender really makes it work. It's, it's the kind of role that many would embarrass themselves with, but he does quite well. Now, the... Yes, to get a little bit into the, the character that there is, basically, yeah, Fassbender as, as Stelios is, you know, yelling and laughing uproariously and trying to, you know, he's very much the warrior, and and he has this sort of friendly rivalry with this other Spartan named Astinos, who's like, he's the, the captain's son, and the, yeah, the, yeah, the two of them have this playful rivalry. It's it's very, you know, what's it, G Gimli and... Crap. Yeah, the, the elf. 
you know, Lord of the Rings with, you know, counting kills, that, that kind of thing. And it is indeed true. You could, you, you could switch their lines and you wouldn't be able to, to, to tell the difference. They're, they're essentially the same character. And, I mean, even Stelios had a little bit of an arc in the comic where he's, he starts as kind of the, the put-upon. He's, he's very much the one struggling to keep up and basically, you know, the captain refuses to call him, but he calls him something like Trip Leos because he, he trips at the start of the, of the comic and only over the course of it does he earn the respect of the captain and Leonidas. And in this, it's just, in fact, in this, early on, he says, oh, I've fought tons of battles, where very much the, the idea you get from the comic is this is maybe his first battle ever. And, yeah, so that... And Leonidas himself is very much... If he, he comes across fairly progressive, which I understand he was not in real life, but he's very much fighting for the, yeah, to, to keep Greece and Sparta out of the Persian Empire, to not be a, to not be a subject, to, to rule over himself and for his men to do the same. And, you know, democracy basically, the, the, the word freedom is brought up in this. And obviously if one researches it's not quite accurate, but again this is, this is the idealized version, the, the idealized take on the story. Now, the... The, the fighting choreography is use, is using more modern martial arts based on what looks cool, not, not really what they used at the time. And it's worth noting that the, the Spartans fight as a group. It's not the, the typical Hollywood action flick of the individual kind of thing. It's, in, in fact, this might be the, you know, one, or this is one of the more kind of, you know, group-oriented. I suppose it's, it's like, you know, the, the older war films where it's, you know, I guess pre-stuff like Saving Private Ryan, where it's very much, we all fight together and this is, you know, this is bigger than any one of us kind of thing. Now, and yes, as, as already mentioned, there's there's the nationalism trait. There's also, you know, some, some traditional values in there of, you know, I'll, I'll get back to that one. Now, yes, see, so the, the other, other characters, the, the queen, Gorgo, played by Lena Headey, is mostly just devoted to Leonidas and kind of, yeah, there's, there's not an awful lot else going on there, there's, there's clearly love between them, and she, yeah, she's willing to go to great lengths to ensure that there will be, you know, support of, you know, more troops. And then we have Xerxes. I was very surprised when I found out that Xerxes was played by, I, 
think it's Rodrigo Santoros, who was lost Paolo of, of Nikki and Paolo. And as much as I hated him on that show, he is fantastic here. The just the 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 hubris of of Xerxes, this Again, the, the 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 whole Persian thing is very much embodied in him. The the narcissism, the the arrogance. Excuse me. They they are certain that they are better. And the you know they every time he whether it's him saying it or whether it's a messenger on behalf of him saying, you know, it always starts with all you have to do is submit. But if you do not submit, then come the threats. There is no there is no equal footing. It's you you submit to him or else. And just the the way you know at first he's com you show cool calm collected the three C's and you know if something dismays him he he's like shaking with fury and just and his eyes and the whole thing and really the guy has to act pretty much just with his face because the ton of of just piercings and jewelry jewelry make it nearly impossible for him to move without it all like coming apart so he has very little to work with both writing and just you know what he can actually move and he does fantastic with it and the voice as well, which, you know, it's, it's altered to fit his, you know, larger than life stature. And, yeah, the whole thing just works. You, you, can, you can understand why, you know, why they would look at him and say, well, that's, just, that's not just a man, that's a god. Now, the... that more or less covers it. Now the in addition to the the scenes with the queen back at Sparta, this also adds the character of Theron, a politician, a part of the council. And he, again, he feels like he's right out of a Frank Miller story. It's very much this corruptible and contemptible politician. And I think it's Dominic Cooper who plays him, and just the, the, every line, every look, he is such slime, and you just destroy buys him right from the get-go and it's it's fantastic it's exactly as it should be the a lot of the characters in this are very one note but they do hit that one note quite well but but yes obviously it, it would be nice to have more well-rounded characters now this is one of the you know hero stories where you know, it's not just, we're not idolizing them just because they're, you know, we're not just saying they're, they're a badass and because of that they, they won. Here it actually does, you know, it, it explains the, the tactic, tactics that they use. And they make a lot of sense, you know, using the hot gates, it's very much kind of forcing them in, forcing the, the vast Persian Empire into this tiny little opening. And, uh, yeah, so, uh, 
Some people will pay a lot of money to, to watch that kind of thing. And because of the, the tight opening, their numbers won't matter, as Leonidas puts it. And that's, that's basically, so, so it's not just, you know, idolizing this, you know, group or this battle because they were badasses. It's saying they used a smart strategy. And they were badasses. And that's really why the, you know, why, why it worked out the way it did. I'm not going to give it away for those who slept through that history class. Please rate and comment. And hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.